Okay, so I'll begin. I just wanted to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Seth Bloom. I'm Senior Director of Attorney Services at Level Set, based out of New Orleans, Louisiana. We're really excited today to have another webinar. Um, these webinars are designed to help you uh, as a construction industry person get a little bit more legal information uh, for free from one of our great uh, attorney network members. And today we have Colin Schmidt uh, from <clears throat> Von Bayo. Uh, he's going to talk about Prompt Payment Act. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Colin. And if you have any questions, just uh, post them right on here down at the bottom where it says ask a question or in the chat. And I will ask Colin that question and we'll also save some time for the very end. So Colin, thank you so much for doing this. I uh, look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Seth. As I said, I'm Colin Schmidt from Von Bayo. And I'm here to talk about New Jersey's Prompt Payment Act and Pennsylvania's Contractor and Subcontractor Payment Act. Um, I think from the start, it's important to know why or who should be listening to this conversation. I think as a contractor, you're probably thinking, look, the construction law, that's kind of your deal. That's not mine. But I want to talk about why it's useful for contractors to understand the laws which were enacted for their specific protection and help them get paid promptly. So um, I guess to speak by an analogy, if a seller were to approach me and said, Colin, um, I want to sell you a, um, a bag of cocaine, uh, perform uh, sexual services for you, and sell you a bazooka uh, via written contract, and I thought, well, those aren't really my hobbies, and I'm happily married. Mm, but how much is it? And they said a thousand dollars. And I said, well, that seems like a reasonable deal. I think I'm gonna go forward with it. I give them a thousand dollars, but they don't deliver. If I were to sue them in court, and I to the judge and said, your honor, I paid a thousand dollars for these services. The judge would say, uh, sir, you're out of luck. And the reason why is because those things are all prohibited by statute. Prostitution is illegal. Possession of narcotics is illegal. And I don't think you can lawfully own a bazooka as a citizen. The reason why I'm saying that is that it's an analogy and there's limits to it. Those are criminal statutes. But at the same time, these contractor payment statutes protect contractors independent of any clauses in the contract. So I think it's important for, um, I think it's important for us to really talk about it in more detail. So the first one I want to talk about is the Contractor and Subcontractor Payment Act. Um, the first thing to know about this is it was recently enacted in 1994 and it was substantively amended in 2018. Um, for your notice, I will, I will point out that on this um, PowerPoint slide, the text which is in blue denotes 2018 changes and uh, the other ones are earlier measures of it. So the first thing to know is that who it applies to. It applies to all contractors and subcontractors, regardless whether the project is public or private. Uh, it doesn't matter whether who the owner is, it's whether it's commercial, whether it's a huge apartment building. The best way to describe who it, who it applies to is to talk about who it doesn't apply to. If you are doing a residential contractor, uh, whether it's six homes or fewer, then you don't have relief under this act. If you're going to build a complex and you're working as electrician on a eight unit complex, you're entitled to relief under this provision. The other part that doesn't apply is that if you are um, selling materials or supplies to the owner of a project uh, for their own property. One of the important changes in 2018 was the prohibition on waiver. There's no way that if you are a general contractor signing an owner's contract or if you're a subcontractor, signing AJC's contract, you can waive these protections. So it's a very important bargaining point. I think often you'll see that GCs get to control um, a lot of the factors in a project because they wrote the contract. These statutory reliefs apply to both contractors and subcontractors. Um, there's some restrictions on CASPA in general. Um, the biggest one is the courts are going to give them relief but courts always relate back to the actual contract itself. And there's a balance to this. Like I said in the first part, these protections can't be waived, but you have to perform the contract as it's written. But if you do, then you are firmly entitled to uh, payment for those services rendered. 
Um, that's right there in the statute under section 504. Uh, the other thing is there also, I note in Pennsylvania that the construction contract itself is an agreement, whether it's written or oral, um, to perform work on a property. Now, Pennsylvania is different like that. New Jersey doesn't allow verbal contracts as much. I note that while verbal contracts are eligible to file a lien on in Pennsylvania and for relief under CASPA, you, you really should avoid it if possible. It's always better to have a written contract. So the owner's payment obligations under CASPA are under Section 505. And it, it, the most important thing about this statute is that it puts an affirmative obligation on the owner to pay in a timely manner. Um, if the contract is silent about it, if it doesn't say when the owner has to pay, it's at the end of the billing period. And the billing period is usually monthly is the way it's set up. Um, but it's important to note that the payments due um, 20 days after the end of the billing period or the invoice delivery, whichever one comes later. Typically, if you're a contractor, invoices go in monthly. So the owner has an obligation to pay you within 20 days if the work was actually performed. Now, the next part is the core relief here that's, that exists for contractors and subcontractors under CASPA. And in Pennsylvania, it says that the payment's not issued by the owner within seven days. The contractor gets interest at 1% per month. That is pretty substantial. 1% sounds small, and that's because we talk about an annual basis. 1% per month can stack up quickly, and that's the first 1% core provision of relief under CASPA. Now, the counterbalance to that is the owner's right to withhold um, in good faith for a deficient performance by the contractor. Now, this is under 506, the law. Um, so I think the best way to explain this is to talk about the typical AIA billing where there's a schedule of values and a breakdown of the work that's to be performed. Uh, the owner's got a right to withhold payment for deficiency items for the contract, things that aren't done, things that are incomplete or they're done um, incorrectly. But if there's six items that are billed and five of them are correct, the owner is not allowed to hold back for all six, just the one which is deficient. The law is very specific about this because they know the hijinks that can go on in this situation, that owners and GCs can both get cute with it. Um, so the most important thing if you're the owner side is that you have to provide written notice of the deficiency within 14 days of receiving the invoice from the contractor. <clears throat> if there's multiple items that are withheld, and you know, say the again the example with the AA contract, say there's 12 items that are withheld. Um, as the contractor makes right on those items, the owner is obligated to issue payment accordingly. As soon as the item is done, that work has to be done. I'm sorry, the payment has to be issued. The next one here is to talk about the payment obligations from between you know, general contractors and subcontractors. And this really echoes and piggybacks upon the same provisions which accord direct contractors payment relief from the owners. Uh, the first part about this is that if you're the GC in a project, you must disclose to your subs the due date for your payments from the owner. This is for situations where the contract is set up as pay when paid. Um, the, the statute puts an obligation upon the GC to tell its subs, look, I get paid, I invoice this date, I usually get paid this date, because then the sub can plan accordingly. Now, if the GC misrepresents to a subcontractors or if they don't say anything at all, if they just refuse to share it um, or don't provide any notice of it, this law presumes that it's the same, the same payment structure laid out in section 505, which is 20 days. So the presumption is that after the, the sub submits his invoice, it'll go up the chain and the GC will be paid within 20 days. And then after that, you see the next bullet point down, the presumption by the statute is that, well, I'm sorry, the obligation under the statute is that the GC has to pay the subcontractor within 14 days of receiving payment from the owner. Now, I think it's important to note if you're the GC or if you're the sub, the application of this. If you are the GC and you choose not to share this information with your subs, the law does not care. It just presumes that you're getting paid, um, you know, within 20 days of receiving, I'm sorry, paid within 20 days of submitting your invoice to the owner. And then after that, 14 days, you would have to pay the subcontractor. 
So if it's otherwise, or if the um, if it's otherwise, or if the owner doesn't pay you and you didn't share it, you're still on the hook. This is important if you're a GC because general contractors build projects. They are not developers. They don't take on that different sort of risk, and they don't like financing projects. So it's important if you're the general contractor that you understand the risk of keeping your cards close to your vest. The law is supposed to encourage transparency all through the chain. Now, if the payment is late from the general contractor to the subcontractor, the actual law itself refers back to the previous provisions. So if the contractor um, is slow with subs, the subs get the same relief that we talked about before. That's the 1% per statute and the other items that are there. I don't have a, um, a separate slide out, but I want to point out um, before I get into the other relief that there is a provision in CASPA under uh, Section 508 that talks about if there's errors in the invoices, because we know sometimes there are simply mistakes in the invoices where something is misbilled or um, prematurely billed. CASPA says that the party that receives that invoice must give written notice to the billing party within 10 days of receiving it and that they have to pay the correct amount in accordance with CASPA. Now, as I said before, this law is relatively recent, so that's somewhat ambiguous, but it's pretty clear what it's trying to communicate. It's trying to say the same provisions that are through here. If the amount is put forward by the billing party, you have an affirmative obligation to share a written response to reason why you should not pay it. This goes all through the chain. When I say GCs to subs, it applies to subs and lower tier subcontractors or sub sub subcontractors. The next provision of this, which I want to talk about, is the, the penalty and attorney fee provision under CASPA, which is, frankly, it's the most important part of it. So in addition to the 1% interest per month, which was allowed under the previous provision, this says that if the non-paid party has to start an arbitration or a lawsuit um, under CASPA to get paid promptly, that they're entitled to a penalty interest of 1% per month. Now, I think it's important to talk about penalty in the context of contracts. Usually contract law says no penalties. All you get for the contract is what the bargain's there. There's no penalty. It's not a tort action. What you get is what you build and what you set out. This, this lawsuit specifically provides unpaid parties with penalty interest on those um, improperly or w improperly withheld sums. Now, this 1% per month is on top of the one, other 1% per month. So I don't think you need to be a mathematician to figure out what that is. I mean, if it's 1% per month and it compounds like that, that's at least 24% annually. 12 plus 12 plus compounds, um, like I said, monthly. So it would be more than that because it builds each month. The idea is that it's supposed to be a deterrent. It's supposed to deter owners from improperly withholding sums and GCs from improperly withholding from subcontractors. Now, the statute itself it says that the amount shall not be wrongfully withheld if the amount withheld bears a reasonable relation to the value of the paying party's good faith deficiency claim. In other words, if you are a GC in a project and the electrician has um, billed for all kinds of work uh, to finish the project off, but you have a punch list and there's some um, outlets that don't work for some minor items that are small, you can't withhold 30% of the contract value based upon these smaller punchless items. It has to be reason related to it. You're not allowed to exploit that. You're not allowed to blow it up and make it seem like it's bigger than it is in order to with pro improperly withhold those sums. The final part of this, which is really important both for me and for my clients, because let's face it, attorneys are expensive, um, it's the fee switching provision of it. Now, usually in, they call it the American rule. The American rule is that everyone pays for their own lawyer. There's ways to deviate from that. Contractually, it can say that, you know, if there's litigation, the prevailing party is entitled to it. Um, courts will often follow that, but they don't have to. If it's contract clause, which assures legal fees, courts kind of have the discretion to do it. But if it's by statute, if it's by the law, they can't, that they have to give attorneys fees, judges are much more willing, or much more obligated, I should say, to follow and enforce that. But I do note that it says the substantially prevailing party. Now, that means that it's not risk-free. If you're a party that's not paid, and your underlying invoice was inflated and improper, and you know it, 
I would not start a CASPA lawsuit under that manner because if you do uh, and you, you push it too far, then you're not going to get attorney's fees and expenses. And that is a major deterrent and encourages, again, the parties to do fair dealing and candor with um, their interactions. One of the most important updates of the 2018 uh, uh, revisions to CASPA was a provision that allowed, um, it was under Section 507, it basically allows contractors um, the opportunity or the right to stop the bleeding on a project which is bad. But it's not a instant stop of the bleed, I should say. Um, so it's important to switch because I, I know that if you're on a project that's bad as a contractor and you have a GC that's being unreasonable or an owner that's not paying you promptly, it's, it's hard to keep doing it because then you're paying it out of your pocket. You're paying for your labor with the expectation that you'll get paid eventually when it's done and sometimes for reasons that are already outside your control you, you might know that that's unlikely this change to caspa in 2018 allows you to basically suspend your performance but it's pretty complicated so going through it if, if you have the end of the billing period and it's been you know your due payment whether it's 14 days as a subcontractor or 20 days as, as a direct contractor after that billing period is not done, you have 30 calendar days since the end of the billing period to submit um, a written notice that the payment's late. Now, after that first written notice, you have to wait another 30 days before sending a second, basically a notice of intent to suspend it. So you have 30 days after the initial billing period, another 30 makes it 60, and then you give them 10 day notice. That's 70 days. That's over two months of waiting to be paid after the billing is done. It's not a it's not a golden ticket. I mean, it's it's relief which contractors are entitled to, and it doesn't um, it prevents them from 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 bleeding out completely. But it's still going to take a while to to activate. Another provision of CASPA, which is um, pretty complex is under section 509 and the retainage is is a situation which I think all contractors understand um, is complicated but at the end of a project is where things can get a little squirrely so I think there's a reason why CASPA decided to take this on so specifically as they did um, the biggest change in this is that if you are a subcontractor who works early in a project say you are doing the earthwork or say you're the steel erector Previously, without this, by law, the general contractor owner could say, well, when the project is substantially complete, we'll pay out retainage. CASPA, after 2018, now says that the retainage must be released within 30 days of final acceptance of the work. This is the, this is the core relief under these changes, is that once the work is done and accepted, they have 30 days to do it. They can't hold back. They don't get to use the subcontractor payments as a bank of funds upon which either the GC or the owner can, can use to finance the project. There's other provisions of this which says that upon substantial completion, um, a, a, the billing party may, and that's the actual word they use in the statute, may facilitate release by posting a maintenance bond for 120% of retainage. I, I don't, that wording is a little bit unexact and it doesn't give me a whole lot of comfort. Um, it also says the owner isn't retaining, the GC can still retain from their subs, but they must pay the retainage within 30 days after final acceptance. And it's important to note that the same provisions I said before would also apply to this. For the general contractor and someone did your sheeting and shoring on a big foundation project, once those, once those foundations are accepted, you have 30 days to pay it. You can't hold it back to the end. Or if you do, you get to the next provision here. The GC must pay their subs and the subs must pay their lower tier subcontractors within 14 days of receiving retainage payment. That's the same um, payment windows uh, that were under the previous section that we talked about under, uh, under section 507. Um, and also any owner, contractor, or subcontractor who holds retainage for more than 30 days after the acceptance but doesn't provide written notice for the reason why that money is being withheld in excess of that is subject to the same penalty and attorney's fees, which we discussed earlier. So again, that's 1% plus 1% per month um, and attorney's fees. The idea of this law is that it forces people with the money to pay down the chain. 
uh, on these construction projects, cash flow is critical. And I think this law recognizes that owners or the larger parties can't simply push that finance and obligation down to the chain, down the chain, to the people that are doing the actual work. Uh, finally, in this is the um, the applicable law. The applicable law in this case, um, I guess I, I would say this. So if you have a contract that says choice of law, and the project must be being built in Pennsylvania to be covered, but say the GC is from uh, New Jersey or New York or Maryland or Ohio, if there's a choice of law in there that says that all disputes under this contract are governed by the law of Ohio, and you're working on a project in Western Pennsylvania, you should understand that that clause itself is not enforceable under the statute. If you sue that general contractor who might be based in Ohio, in Pennsylvania, you are entitled to relief under this. This can't be waived. It says right there, the law itself shall be unenforceable. I think that's important to note um, because in most cases, in most consumer contracts, whether you're buying a computer or anything else, um, it's going to uh, it's going to let the it's going to let the bigger party choose the form. They're going to say, you know, we get to choose where it is, and you have to litigate in whatever form or venue which the contract dictates. Caspa says no. I'll move on to New Jersey. The New Jersey Prompt Payment Act was enacted in 2006 and includes public-private projects. Um, and it's again, it was enacted to address the ongoing issue of delayed payments to contractors. It applies to prime contractors, subcontractors, lower share com lower tier subcontractors, material and service providers, and it also includes architects and engineers. That's different from CASPA, and the relief there is, uh, is somewhat stronger. Like CASPA, the Prompt Payment Act in New Jersey puts an affirmative obligation on the party who's paying to give a reason for why they're not going to pay you. Um, again, on this one, courts will also look to the, the contract itself. You have to understand, if you're an unpaid party and you file a claim under PPA, the Prompt Payment Act, or under CASPA, the first thing the non-paying party is going to do is point to the contract and allege that there's some part of the contract which you didn't do, you didn't do correctly or you left incomplete, which justifies that withholding. Now, the important thing here is that under the PPA, the law specifically says that the law has to be paid in 30 days of receipt, and unless the there's a um, unless the, the contractor's bills are deemed approved per the statutory language, it says they're deemed approved if the owner fails to provide any written statement of the amount withheld and the reason for withholding payment. This is a very powerful tool for contractors to use. It really shifts the burden back from them to the party that's not paying. This goes down the line. So the same protections are allowed for subs. If the sub is performed in accordance with its subcontract agreement with the GC and the work is accepted by the owner, the GC must pay the sub within 10 days of receiving that incremental payment from the owner on the project. And I should say in this one, this is there should be an asterisk next to that, next to this. If it is a public project in New Jersey, say you're working for um, a county and the payment of an invoice has to go through a county approval process and that county meets every two months, that provision must be spelled out in the contract. But if it is in the contract, it trumps this. The New Jersey statute carves out a special privilege for government entities to meet periodically and have to give approvals for invoices. So these same durations they apply to sub uh, lower tier subcontractors. I'm sorry about that. <clears throat> they apply to lower tier subcontractors, um, but they don't apply to retainers. That part is separate. Now, relief under the Prompt Payment Act is a little bit different than our CASPA. CASPA, you get the 1% per month. Under Prompt Payment Act, you have the prime rate plus 1% beginning on the date after payment was due to be paid. Now, that's a mouthful, and the prime rate is currently pretty low. I think it's Today's August 20th, 2020, I think it's three and a half percent. So it'd be four and a half percent. And now if this went back further, if you weren't paid for a period of time before that, the interest is very complicated to calculate, but I've done it before. You just do a table and you figure out what the interest is and what payments were due. Also in the Prompt Payment Act, and this is the same kind of relief that's under CASPA, the contractor who isn't paid is allowed to suspend performance, but under the Prompt Payment Act, the relief is much quicker. After providing seven days written notice of their intent to suspend performance, an unpaid party can suspend work without breaching the contract. 
this is very important if you're in New Jersey because the last thing you want to do if you're a subcontractor or a contractor is not being paid is say, I'm stopping. And then if you do that, you, you make yourself liable or potentially liable for a lawsuit from the owner to, for you not performing the project. The Prompt Payment Act spe specifically allows um, contractors who aren't being paid the right, the affirmative right, to suspend performance. Again, also, like CASPA, the Prompt Payment Act entitles the prevailing party uh, reasonable attorney's fees and legal costs if they have to go forward with a lawsuit. Um, again, not like CASPA, like CASPA is prevailing party. So you can't make a claim uh, without risk. If you make a claim which has no merit or which you don't think you're going to be, um, you didn't accurately bill on a project, I wouldn't file a prompt payment act claim because you're meant to pay the other side's attorney's fees. The thing that's important about both these laws is that they're recently enacted. CASPA's in 1994, it was strengthened in 2018. Prompt payment was acted in 2006. And the case law for this is very scarce, it's very limited. I think it's important when you talk about litigation to understand that courts are innately conservative. And I don't mean that in a political sense, I mean that these laws, in order to get more support, they need to be utilized. They need case law support. So if you look at Pennsylvania law, if I get my, my Lexus Nexus or West law, Pennsylvania has 130 decisions, published decisions, I'm sorry, accessible decisions, which rely on CASPA. New Jersey only has 28 for the Prompt Payment Act. Now, whether it's published or unpublished is important because published decisions are mandatory on all lower courts underneath it, and unpublished are simply persuasive. That's very hard for construction cases. Construction cases are notoriously difficult to litigate because they turn on details which are very specific or minute or difficult to understand from the outside. Judges don't get it. You have to really walk them through it very carefully and tell the story in a way that's persuasive and explain to them why some detail controls the situation, or why this party, why your client is entitled to relief. Of Pennsylvania's 130 decisions, uh, 13 were unpublished, so that's actually a pretty high percentage. Pennsylvania is a little more consistent. New Jersey, on the other hand, there's only 28 decisions, 25 were unpublished. That puts New Jersey clients in a tough kind of space. So if you're wondering in Jersey whether or not you should sue in the Prompt Payment Act, you have to understand there's very limited mandatory authority. You have to be sure of your claims. You have to have a situation where the paying party intentionally and improperly withheld payment. So I think what's important for this, I think we're getting, Seth, correct me if I'm wrong, are we getting close? We are, but take your time if you need an extra few minutes to finish up. Um, okay. Float over a few minutes and, and just to anyone out there right now uh, that's participating, if you have any questions, just uh, feel free to ask. And of course, we'll allow a minute or two at the end. I know it's been a pretty quiet room, but that's okay. We can, you can submit your questions later. Uh, at the Expert Center, or if you have any direct questions, you can talk to Colin, but continue. Sure, you have a few more minutes. Yeah, thanks, Seth. I, I appreciate it. I think that's, well, I think it's important to talk about what the benefit is of level set um, to me as a construction attorney. So my background is all construction before I became an attorney. I, I worked for a lot of big construction managers, and um, I, I was involved in the side of litigation, and I saw that at the end of it, the litigation part wasn't as hard as the construction part. And I thought, well, I should go to law school. Uh, you know, it, it'd probably be a lot more gratifying. I don't think that's actually proven to be very true. But at the end of it, I think it's always important to tie back how these laws are and how they practically benefit contractors, how they can use them. I'm basically endorsing these laws for contractors and subcontractors to consider if you're not being paid on a project. So from a very practical point, the first thing you want to do is you have to have an agreement which is established. As I said before, verbal contracts are possible, but you really shouldn't. That goes anywhere in the chain. It's always better to have it defined so you can have a written thing that you can, you can rely on. Um, the second thing is pretty elemental, but you have to know and follow your agreement. Both CASPA and Prompt Payment Act depend upon performance of the contract in accordance with that contract's terms. Other than those provisions which I outlined, the things that aren't waivable, you still have to perform. If the contract part of it is uh, unclear and unenforceable, that's statutory relief you get, but it doesn't cross out or it doesn't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't expand to overlap those other issues of the contract. You still need to perform per the contract because you know if you're going to sue for a payment from a, from a party, whether it's a general contractor or an owner, the defense side is going to pull that out immediately. They're going to find everything you did wrong with the project and they're going to put it in your face and say that their party was entitled to withhold payment for it. 
the most important thing I want you to get from this today is 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 to get into a habit if you're a contractor of billing properly. This goes for almost any business. Collections is a part of any business. Under these laws, they both hinge upon invoices. There's no there's no situation where you can you can be graceful or say to the contractor or, or you know the general contractor or the owner, oh, well I'll get you the invoice when it comes in. All these things turn upon when the invoice is submitted. The best way to ensure that you can be protected under this is to build this into your practice. Make it completely separate. If you're a small person doing through this, make sure you carve it out at the same time every month for a particular project. If you're a larger organization that has it, make sure you have someone who follows these deadlines. This relief is here under the statute. It exists for contractor protection, but you have to use it. And the most important way to do it is to invoice consistently, timely, and accurately. Um, I think that you know it's important for a contractor to 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 know this law. I, I I don't say it's important to know it as well as I do, but having a general background of it and knowing how it can protect your business is very useful. Um, you know the billing periods for the contract are important to set out. The reasons why the paying party can withhold are really important to know. I think the deemed approvals, especially in New Jersey, are really important because once they do that, that puts them in a box. I think that. Um, it's going to take some time for this law to get strength. These are recent statutes. In order to get there, uh, they need some case law to exercise it. But that shouldn't sow any doubt in your brain about whether or not it's worth going after. The reality is, is that this, these laws were enacted for the protection of contractors. I mean, the Prompt Payment Act and the Contractor and Subcontractor Payment Act, the entire premise is that these people were not being paid promptly. So when this kind of remedial act uh, was enacted for your protection, Judges are obligated to follow it. Um, and the expectation when the legislature makes a law is that it's going to control the situation. It might take some time. It might take some time to get a foothold. But at the end of it, the law is passed to dictate how businesses function. In order to make that process grow and to evolve properly, as contractors, we have to start using this. We have to make better use of it. We have to make owners and developers and government agencies aware of the risk of non-payment. Um, contractors who understand this law uh, they get paid more consistently. I think that's important for any business. That's all I have. Is there any questions? I apologize. My computer was being a little sticky there, getting back on. Um, yeah, we have a question from Rachel. Um, do you, as a general contractor, have to bill for your final retainage in Pennsylvania to trigger the timeline, or does it automatically start from the date of final acceptance? Thank you, Rachel, for your question. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. So this would be another situation where the law can be specific, but this is going to fall into that other basket. That basket is in accordance with the contract. What does the contract say? If the contract says that retainage is due at a certain point, then that's that's one thing. If the contract says you have to bill for it like everything else, they need to bill for it. So I think it would really depend upon your contract language. I would have to see the actual contract upon which it's based. But usually the way it works is if you don't ask for it, you're not going to get it. So it's always if when in doubt, issue the invoice. If the building's been accepted, if it's passed whatever the milestone is, substantial completion or final completion, and you're entitled to bill for retainage, by all means send the send the invoice out and get it out. You know, when in doubt, if you're entitled to it, assuming it's in, in accordance with the contract itself, I would bill the client. Well, and I have a question because this is about New Jersey and uh, Pennsylvania. How often are you dealing with uh, cases where the, there's actually both, case, both states' laws are involved? I mean, I know a lot of people that live in, for instance, Philadelphia, but, or work in Philadelphia, but live uh, in New Jersey. Does there, is there an overlap there? And, and which law um, is supreme? Well, it would depend upon it would depend upon where the project is located. I mean, generally speaking, both these laws, I, I don't think for the Prompt Payment Act, I didn't cite it, but it says all actions. I think I'm, I'm going from memory now, which is dangerous for any lawyer to do. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure the Prompt Payment Act, Prompt Payment Act, turns on the same thing as CASPA. If the construction project itself is located physically within New Jersey, then the Prompt Payment Act would apply. In order for CASPA to apply, the project would have to be built in Pennsylvania and also qualify, or you know, not be less than six simultaneous residential units or materials to an owner directly. But other than that, it's pretty much based upon where the project is located. Um, you know, as I said in CASPA, there's no, you can't, you can't dictate form. If you're an out-of-state contractor in New York, you can't say for a project being built in Pennsylvania, 
that any legal matters have to be filed in New York State. CASPA doesn't doesn't recognize that. You can sue them in Pennsylvania and they need to respond. Okay, well, I don't see any other questions out there, but uh, if you have any other questions, and I'm sure some are gonna come up, then please post them on our Expert Center, our attorney network, um, which you can find at Level Set, where it says, ask a lawyer a question. That would be great. You can get an answer from Colin or someone else uh, in your area. Uh, also, if you have questions for Colin or need an attorney, then go ahead and go straight to his firm and contact him directly. Uh, Colin, thank you so much for everything today. We really appreciate it. We look forward to you answering questions uh, at the Attorney Network, uh, as well as participating in more webinars, CLEs, uh, virtual conferences, and all the great stuff that Level Set has coming out uh, in the next few months. So thanks again. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Seth, and thanks for everyone who listened. Any questions or any concerns, by all means, please feel free to reach out, and we can talk about it. Thanks again. Thank you.